some of you uh, may have been, uh, some of you were, uh, in uh, the group yesterday when I gave a different lecture, uh, one that I'm hoping to kind of pick up on in my lecture today. And I began that lecture by kind of explaining what brings me to this particular series that the history department is doing and that the Haven Center is, is working with history to do, which is a series on emancipation. And again, it, it's sort of on the surface, you would wonder why in the world is somebody who's working on imprisonment, uh, which is the sort of the seeming opposite of emancipation doing here, talking about this. Um, but what I wanted to suggest yesterday, and I'll continue today to suggest, is that the current situation in this country vis-a-vis -vis imprisonment raises serious and vitally important questions about what it means to be a citizen of this country. And I think more specifically, it forces us to think through the implications of what it really means to have lost your freedom in this society, even if temporarily, through incarceration. And so these are some of the themes that I hope connect my work to, to other work that's being done here this semester. So yesterday when I was here, I gave a lecture to try to lay the groundwork for this broader discussion. I asked us to really consider what some of these broader costs of building such a large, massive carceral state over the last 40 years have been. Um, I suggested that some of these costs were both unnecessarily and shamefully uh, newly punitive conditions for those who serve time themselves. But also that beyond that, uh, there have been enormous costs for our cities, our communities, and our economy. It has undermined our economy, it has eroded our communities and our cities. And I left off that lecture with a question, which is if you buy what I'm saying about why this is such a, such a crisis, so bad, then why haven't people changed it? And we talked a little bit about that yesterday, why haven't all of us changed it? And there's some complicated reasons for that. But I suggested that there's some really interesting reasons about why the people most affected by it have not changed it. And what I hinted is that this goes to the heart of this question of our democracy and the ways in which the carceral state and having such a huge carceral state has in fact diluted and distorted our democracy, one that we take very seriously and uh, are very prideful of. So it turns out that the main consequence of having built such a massive and punitive carceral state over the last 40 years, and what is that? That's the locking up of unprecedented numbers of citizens in this country, or what we are now calling mass incarceration. Mass incarceration itself served to shift political power in this country in very important ways and in ways that were very specifically favorable to those who supported a larger rather than a smaller national investment in prisons and punishment. And this is the argument that I'm going to explore this afternoon and I want to begin with a bit of a caveat which is to say that I'm not a political scientist and I am not a sociologist, I am a historian. And so for those of you who are in both of those fields, some of my talk may be a little frustrating in that it's a little bit uh, looser than, um, than usually when people are talking about politics and things like voting. But I would ask that you bear with me because I am at least trying to draw out some of these larger themes about how our democracy has been distorted and how power has shifted uh, towards those least likely to dismantle this large carceral state. And I'm going to make the case, as I tried to do yesterday, that we should all care about this a great deal, even if we don't particularly spend a lot of time thinking about prisons or punishment, even if we don't do work that seems to immediately connect with issues of pri uh, crime or punishment. And here's the bottom line argument that I want to make. That is that at the very moment in our nation's history, when we finally began to open up our democracy, and when we finally began to pledge ourselves seriously to the voting rights of all citizens. Namely, in 1965, 19, I'm slipping here. <laughs> Were it in 1865? In 1965, with the Voting Rights Act of 1965, at that very moment, distinctly and specifically, we also began a war on crime. A war on crime, a massive war on crime that today, I will suggest, has not only completely undermined this arguably most important victory of the civil rights era, but has also undercut the exciting possibilities for opening our democracy even further and shifting power more downward that recent high rates of immigration in this country, particularly from Latinos, has posed. 
So I want to make a, quite a large argument and, and hope uh, to persuade you. So to get this started, I first need to begin with two little bits of background. First, a bit on the state of our justice system today, and secondly, a bit on our voting history, sort of the history of the franchise and, and what brings us to this question today. So first, the snapshot of our uh, nation's criminal justice system, and my apologies for those of you who are also here today, a little bit of this will be repetitive. The first thing we need to do is to talk about this rise of a massive carceral state. It may seem obvious, but it's extraordinary to me how few of our citizens think about this at all. This is a massive shift in public resources, a massive shift in bodies, a massive shift in uh, priorities that is rarely on our uh, agenda when we talk. If you turn on CNN, if you turn on MSNBC, if you turn on any of these stations, you will rarely, rarely, rarely hear a discussion of what I'm going to talk about today, despite the fact that as the 20th century ended and the 21st century began, something really remarkable happens in this country, something that is both internationally unparalleled, that is to say it hasn't happened anywhere else on the globe, but also historically unprecedented, that is to say it's never happened here. And what is that? Between 1970 and 2010, more people were incarcerated in this country than were imprisoned anywhere else in the world. And at no point in our nation's recorded past had the economic, the social, and the political institutions of our country become so bound up with the practice of punishment. Again, something that we don't think about a lot. So what does the data look like? By 2007, you had more than 7.3 million people ensnared in this system in some form or fashion. That's one out of every 31 US residents. And there were more than 2 million actually locked up right, in prisons. Now in Wisconsin, just to give you a sense of what this means locally, this meant an average daily prison population of about 23,000, slightly over, by 2013. But what is significant is it meant about 90,000 people in the state under some form of correctional control, which is a staggering number of people by any estimation. I'm from Pennsylvania right now. I can tell you it's even more staggering there. Uh, it depends on where you live, how bad it is, but that's, that's a quite shocking mm -hmm. number. And if we look at these figures, and we look at them, again, internationally, and I apologize for my poor graphics here, but we see that the United States houses more inmates than the top 25 European countries combined. So we are completely out of sync, not just with places around the globe that we would consider totalitarian or not in sync with our own democratic values. We are completely out of sync with countries that we would respect as uh, equals to our, ourselves with regard to our polity. And I want to make the case that these figures matter a great deal. But first, a bit of background on the history of voting. I want to just take a little moment with the, with the indulgence of my historian colleagues in the room to highlight some of our nation's history of democracy and specifically our nation's history with voting so that we have some background for making sense of how our democracy has been undermined by the rise of that carceral state I just mentioned a moment ago. So some of this is going to be no surprise to anyone. The issue of voting rights in this country has been a thorny issue from jump. Never in this country has the issue of who has the franchise been easily determined, easily solved. It's always been a matter of conflict. It's always been contested. And indeed, if you look at who has the right to vote in this country over time, it shifts dramatically. What you can vote for, who can vote, um, eligibility to vote in the US is determined both by federal and by state law. Um, and so who gets to vote for president versus who gets to vote for local dog catcher is a common, it's, it's dependent on a lot of different things. Um, and indeed, in absence of federal law making clear what these rules are, states have an incredible discretion to make decisions about who gets to vote for what at the local level uh, to establish qualifications for uh, the vote um, for candidacy, for what the regulations are. Some of you may have watched in the news recently with Pennsylvania, enormous controversy over voter ID laws in Pennsylvania around the country. This is an example of how states can do enormous, uh, have enormous leeway uh, to deal with this question of suffrage. Now, remember, of course, that when this country is first founded, that the franchise is extremely limited. Only white men with property, with wealth, that demonstrated wealth, uh, were easily able to vote. Um, we have an opening up of the franchise for a moment around the time of the American Revolution, and you may be interested to know that freed slaves could already vote that early uh, in four states. Um, 
Women, of course, always got the short end of that stick for a very, very long time. Um, and by the time we get to the American Civil War, um, we see an opening up of voting for white men for a moment, but still this issue of property was really crucial, wealth was really crucial, and indeed literacy tests, poll taxes, even religious tests were used at the local level to uh, disfranchise people. Again, particularly the poor, always the women, uh, usually the racially other, depending on where you were. So needless to say, after the Civil War, with more than four million newly freed human beings on the scene that could change the vote, this gets even thornier, particularly in certain areas of the South where African Americans outnumber whites. So power could demonstrably shift in really profound ways if you were to change the franchise. Now, it's important to realize that the Civil War is a real turning point here because it's after the Civil War that we get at least four of the 15 constitutional amendments say something about voting, have something to do with voting, um, and indeed specifically seem to make it op more open to certain parties as we go through time. So the first thing, of course, we get the 14th Amendment of 1868, which determines that where you're born should not change your right to vote. All persons born or naturalized are citizens of the United States and the state where they reside. Then we get the 15th Amendment in 1870, which makes clear we thought that one's race, color, or previous condition of servitude, very important, should also not impede your access to the ballot. And then moving forward, we get the 19th Amendment, and oh my goodness, and finally we get women allowed to exercise the franchise, and the 24th Amendment in 1964, it, we finally established you can't be barred from the polls by reason of failure to pay a certain tax or poll tax or other tax. And jumping all the way up to 1971 with the 26th Amendment, it's clear that you can vote if you're at least 18. We, you know, we make sure you can't bar people on the basis of age from voting. And I borrow all this from the scholars of voting. This is not my own work. Again, this is just kind of some background I want to share with you. But here's the bottom line when you really think about it. All of these provisions about voting are not necessarily about the right to vote. There's nothing in the Constitution that says we have anything about vote, that, that we have a right to vote. These are all provisions about who can't be prevented from voting, but there's nothing sort of affirmative about voting. And I want to suggest to you that that is going to prove very important as we go through uh, later American history. So now I want to talk about the significance of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This brings us to really, in my view, the most centrally important piece of legislation with regard to voting, but also with regard to what we're going to talk about today with the carceral state. Because the truth was that despite all of these constitutional amendments and all of this wording placed in the Constitution from 1865 onward, again, there was no specific piece of national legislation that expressly outlawed widespread discrimination at the polls that was specifically responsible for disfranchising African Americans at the end of slavery. Now, we did have a few acts. There was quite a few. We had the Act of 1866 that should have settled it 100 years before this act. But it had no teeth. And indeed, we had the 15th Amendment. But again, without teeth, it did very little. Because the truth was that white Southerners on the ground were getting around these affirmations, to the extent they were, uh, for black voting on a daily basis. Again, you know some of these. Poll taxes, literacy requirements, um, putting places to vote completely uh, impossible to get to, which again, we're kind of returning to in important ways. Um, you've heard of grandfather clauses, right? Which is to say that if you know if you're if you uh, if your father or your grandfather were not enfranchised under the Fifteenth Amendment, then you couldn't be. I mean, all these crazy ways to twist uh, the possibility of accessing the vote. So, what is the result of this? The upshot of this is that blacks lose political power almost overnight. They get it. And it means something when they get it. This changes politics in the South. It changes who has power. It changes things fundamentally on the ground. But no sooner does it change than African Americans are disfranchised. And to give you some kind of just figures on this, in Louisiana, there was in 1895, there was about 130,000, a little bit more, blacks registered to vote. By 1898, only 5,000. By 1916, 
only 1,700. I mean, this is a dramatic and concrete disfranchisement of people who had the vote, right to vote. In Selma, Alabama, the voting, voting rolls were 99% white, 1% black, even though there were more black residents in, than whites in the city by the end of Reconstruction. Black voters in Alabama and Florida re were reduced by nearly 90% in very short order as a result of these sort of twists and turns that people put on people's right to vote. Texas, black voting went from 100,000 down to 5,000. So again, you can see power shifting in really important ways. By the 1940s, I want you to just think about this figure for a minute. Only 5% of African Americans in the South were registered to vote, 5%. So this gives you a whole new context for thinking about the Civil Rights Act of 1965, right? The Voting Rights Act, the significance of it. So a central thrust of the Civil Rights Movement was to make the 15th Amendment mean something, right? To give it, those, give it that teeth. And indeed, Congress expressly intends the Civil Rights Act of 65 to outlaw um, many, but particularly the literacy tests that were in place that disfranchised people on the ground. The act was signed into law by Lyndon Johnson, and it was a really important piece of legislation, primarily because what it does is it gives extensive federal oversight power over elections, right? So it means that his states, for example, with a history of discrimination with regard to voting, uh, these so-called covered jurisdictions could not just do what they wanted to do. They had to run it by the feds if they wanted to make changes on the ground with regard to voting. Um, they had to get the approval of the Justice Department in this procedure known as preclearance. That's the good news, really good news. Does it make a difference? Yes, it makes a difference. It makes a difference on the ground. We see black voting uh, surge back up, notably not just in the South. This is a green light for black voting in the North, too, in really profound and important ways, because even though you know, we don't quite have the same structures of literacy tests and poll taxes, there's all kinds of other ways in which blacks are disfranchised in the North. So this is the really good news. The other really good news about this act is that this was an act that has been renewed several times over. Uh, the latest time was in uh, with George W. Bush in 2006, and it got a nice 25-year extension, so we should all be able to take a nice breath because our voting rights are now protected. But here's the thing. At the very same minute when this happens, quite literally, we begin a war on crime. The very same year that Lyndon Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act of 1965, he also signs another really important act, the Law Enforcement Administration Act. Now in short, think about it this way, right when the Civil Rights Movement was seeking to expand the rights of civil, uh, civil rights of African Americans in this nation, politicians decided that it was time to begin a national and federal and state and local war on crime. Now again, I made this point yesterday, we tend to accredit this to Nixon, to Wallace, to Goldwater, to the, to the most conservative uh, elements of this country, but it is important to realize the same president, this is not to knock Johnson, but it's to, to, to point out the bipartisan nature of this moment, Johnson is the one that really begins this with the creation of Leah. Now Leah is really, really important. Well, it's, in fact, it's, it's so striking to me how little work has been done on this, given how important it is. Because what this does is it creates an enormous bureaucracy that makes a war on crime possible. We've always had moments where we wanted to crack down on crime. We've always had moments where we've been feeling particularly committed to crime fighting. But we've never had the enormous bureaucracy to make this possible. That is to say, to fund police departments, right? To train corrections <coughs> officers, to build prisons, essentially to, be, to make this a reality on the ground. Now, it was already in a reality, as Simon's work has shown, it was already a reality in cities like Chicago. It was already a reality around the country, but the reality in the 50s and the reality in the 90s is just, it's a different universe in terms of the scope, the spending, what we're really talking about. So when, when Johnson begins this war on crime, this war on crime is continued by subsequent administrations, but even within his own administration, there's a tremendous buildup of this funding for what will be a war on crime. Now, again, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because I talked about it yesterday, but it is important to ask ourselves, why now? The popular lore says, why now is because in the 60s we get crime, out of control crime. And I spent some time yesterday to try to uh, debunk a little bit of that and to suggest that we need to be really careful when we talk about crime rising in the 60s to be sure it begins to rise pretty dramatically at the end of the decade. 
But right when we actually begin the war on crime, it is not, in fact, staggering. In fact, if you look at the entire array of the 20th century, you quickly realize that the 60s is unremarkable, if not quite safe, compared to other moments. And indeed, if you move from the homicide rate, which is this figure, and go to the violent crime rate, you quickly realize that this nation becomes considerably less safe the more we have a war on crime. So why then? Why then do we begin this war on crime? Well, again, I want to take us back to the Civil War, because something really important begins to happen after the Civil Rights 60s that had also happened after the Civil War which is in the face of all kinds of new claims on the franchise and new claims on power coming from the black community, came a pretty certain backlash that that was the same thing as criminality. And you can look at the language coming out of everywhere from Selma to Detroit, that when people were protesting a lot, that what they were doing was disorderly, it was about law and order, it required a law and order response. And indeed, the reality was that white northern politicians who were all for the civil rights movement in the South, because that was there, felt a lot less happy about it when it was in northern jurisdictions and felt a hell of a lot less happier about things like desegregating neighborhoods and desegregating schools when we were talking about California or Michigan or Wisconsin, right? So we actually, there's many reasons why we begin a war on crime, but it is not coincidental that we do be begin this war on crime in this political moment. And indeed, I just want to share with you, there's a quite well-known historian of crime and punishment, David Hoshinsky, who observed that by locking up newly <coughs> freed African-American men, particularly en masse in the, in the South after the Civil War, the Democrats felt that they were sort of saving their region. They, the term they used was redeeming their region. From the quote unquote, this is a quote from the time, the clutches of black power. Now this is, again, this is right after the Civil War. So similarly, it would appear that those threatened and most unnerved by civil rights and black power activism of the 60s and 70s also uh, reassert their power via the criminal justice system. The impacts of this are devastating. That was what I wanted to talk about yesterday. So enormous fallout. Right, fallout from the drug war, fallout from criminalizing kids in schools, the impact on urban neighborhoods has been catastrophic, I would argue, for our labor, mar for our labor market. It has also had a very dire effect. But here I want to focus on one of its most specific consequences, which is, again, speaking of the obvious, but the mass imprisonment of people of color specifically, disproportionately, and overwhelmingly. So those figures I showed you to start this lecture, which were about how bad our imprisonment situation, I didn't talk about race in that, right? But when we talk about race, we quickly realize what we're really talking about here. This is, I believe this is 2008, the differential between white and black male incarceration. Eventually one in nine young African American men end up in the system. And when we look at women, black women are now the fastest growing group of the incarcerated, and their differential from white women, again, is staggering. So we're not talking just about imprisonment. We're not talking just about mass incarceration. We are talking about racialized mass incarceration uh, very, very specifically. Can I ask you, to, what is that measuring? Uh, this is measuring the rate. And I have, my other slide doesn't have the rate per 100,000, but I can definitely check that for you. My other thing actually has the, the uh, actually has the code on or the key on there, and I don't know why that doesn't. So it's a staggering differential, and it's important that we look at this for numerous reasons, I would say. But today, I want to talk about what this has meant for our democracy. Just like the mass incarceration of African Americans in the wake of the Civil War undermined our democracy. I'm going to talk about that and show you how in a moment it begins to happen again. Now what ends up happening is that the Civil Rights Act of 18, 1965, I keep saying that, again, was passed right at the same moment as LEA. The most obvious and direct mechanism by which African American voting power is undermined, dated to legislation that goes back to the end of the Civil War that said you couldn't vote if you were a prisoner. I'm going to unpack this a little bit in a moment, but we get another very significant legal decision in 1974 called Richardson versus Ramirez, 
that is going to cement this again in all new ways. Now, before I talk about this landmark case in 74, I want to say a few things first about disfranchisement. First of all, it's not a uniquely U.S. phenomenon. It's not a uniquely modern phenomenon. Many societies decide in a given moment, as I hope I've already shown, who gets the vote, who doesn't. It's highly contentious always. But because we have particularly high rates of incarceration in this country and because they are particularly racially targeted, it does, in fact, have repercussions here that it doesn't necessarily have somewhere else. And indeed, those repercussions exist even when, on a state-by-state -state basis, these laws look different. Some states are more liberal, some states are more conservative, some are more restrictive, and so forth. And here's another thing I want us to, to mention before we talk about this 1974 Act, and I just hinted at it. Long before the 1970s, and specifically again in the wake of the Civil War, there was already wording built into the 14th Amendment that allowed for the disfranchisement of otherwise eligible citizens if they had participated in, quote, rebellion or other crime. I'm going to, this is very important. This is clause of Section 2 of the 14th Amendment. It's always been there. Now, why was it always there? Why was that so important to put into the 14th Amendment? Why was Section 2 there? The whole idea behind this clause of the 14th Amendment was to actually keep those who were committing crimes against the Union, so white Southerners, most specifically, those still waging rebellion or who had waged rebellion against the Union from having the franchise too easily, from being able to kind of co-opt the new nation. And indeed, Representative Thaddeus Stevens from Pennsylvania, and if you've all seen Lincoln lately, you know exactly what he looks like. <laughs> um, he really initiates this debate about whether we not, there needs to be specific language in the 14th Amendment about this question of who exactly can vote. And indeed, if you look at this, what, what he was really concerned about is once you know, we had the three-fifths clause, right? Slaves were three-fifths of a white man for voting purposes. Well, with the end of slavery, what was that going to do to apportionment and to representation? There was deep concern over what white voting was in the wake of the Civil War, right? So we get this section, too. You don't need to bother with all the wording, but it was substantially, you know, thick wording about who can and can't vote. Now, I want to just stop for a minute here and say, so right after the Civil War, this, the intention of the 14th Amendment was not to disfranchise people in prison just because they had committed a crime, any crime. Nevertheless, white Southerners at the time hit on this very quickly. And right after the Civil War, as black spaces are criminalized in whole new ways, and as Southern penitentiaries go overnight from all white to all black, which is exactly what happens after the Civil War, Southern states quickly begin to, be, to pass these disfranchisement laws to say, if you've committed a crime, you can't vote. Now again, this was a complete, unintended interpretation of the 14th Amendment at the time, but it was very, very effective. Indeed, in many states, this literally led to the disfranchisement of blacks in the South. So we had poll taxes, we had, liter we had all this stuff, but we also had disfranchisement of people who were in prison. And again, oftentimes for violating things that had been literally made up within the last 10 years. Okay? So in 1974, the Supreme Court is asked to look at this question again. Not coincidentally, as incarceration rates start to rise again in this country, and not coincidentally, as they are again disproportionately targeting people of color. And the Supreme Court is asked to rule expressly on this issue of whether it's constitutional to disfranchise those serving or preserve time in prison. And Richardson, in Richardson versus Ramirez, very significantly, the court did something that many southern white states had done in the wake of the Civil War, which was to interpret Section A, I'm sorry, Section 2 of the 14th Amendment in a way that it was not intended to be interpreted. Indeed, what it decided was that it meant that you could, in fact, take away the vote from a citizen convicted of any crime regardless of whether the crimes were of ideologically suspect nature, whether they were in rebellion, and regardless of whether it would have affected one racial group over another. Now, here's what's interesting. The court actually, the reason why was because of the Civil Rights Act, of, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The idea is we've taken care of the discrimination. 
We now have laws on the books that will make it clear you can't discriminate against someone voting because they're black. So now let's just deal with the fact that you're a criminal. The problem was, of course, the criminalizing of urban space after the civil rights 60s, very much like the criminalizing of black spaces after the Civil War, was deeply, fundamentally, and categorically racialized from the very beginning. So the impact of Richardson versus <coughs> Ramirez was vast and immediate. States across the country set about passing laws that immediately disfranchised, <coughs> again, overwhelmingly black, and here's the thing, overwhelmingly liberal and Democratic Party voters. This is one of these things where I always think of the Democratic Party cutting off its nose despite its face, right? Because what it ends up doing is completely cutting out its own voting base in ways that it really had not thought about. So by the year 2000, about 1.8 million African Americans had been barred from the polls as a result of felon disfranchisement laws. What does this mean? It figures into several highly contested presidential elections that we can all remember from our lifetime. 2000, by the next presidential election, 10 states had African American disfranchisement rates above 15%. So again, we're moving towards the slow taking away of the vote. And there's no question this is figuring into many local contests. And indeed, by 2006, 48 out of 50 U.S. states have passed some form of disfranchisement uh, legislation. And again, eventually, when you have 65 million Americans in this nation with some form of a criminal record, that has profound effects on our democracy. Indeed, according to research by political scientists and sociologists alike, Disfranchisement policies, quote, affected the outcome of seven U.S. Senate races from 1970 to 1998, and in each case, the Democratic candidate would have won rather than the Republican victor. Not only that, but these outcomes, quote, prevented Democratic control of the Senate from 1986 to 2000, and indeed, by excluding Americans with criminal records from the Democratic process, there is speculation pretty well documented date with data that it seems to have provided, quote, a small but clear advantage to Republican candidates in every presidential and senatorial election from 1972 to 2000. So this is not insignificant now, and in fact, arguably more significant than it was after the Civil War. And I don't believe I have the internet here, um, but if I did, do I have the internet here? I do. If you're interested, this is very interesting, you can go on this, uh, the sentencing project. This is an interactive map, and you can look at what felon disfranchisement has done for various states around the country, right? And it's quite extraordinary. If you go down to Florida, right, <coughs> the notorious Florida, okay, you see that 10% of the entire population is disfranchised and over 23% of the black population, which is staggeringly higher than it was in 2000 when it first made national news. So again, just for kicks, you can go on this site. It's, uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. Okay, but this isn't the only story. So I'm gonna wrap up pretty quickly. What's the second part of the story? It's important to realize that our democracy is distorted because of mass incarceration, not just because of these felon disfranchisement laws. Indeed, the embrace of punitive policies in a massive carceral state has also changed democracy because of the way our census counts people. Now, the census has always, with very, you know, with state by state exceptions, the census has always counted prisoners where they are incarcerated. Now, remember, when you don't have that many people incarcerated, no biggie in terms of the way power shifts in a given region. But when you have more than two and a half million people locked behind bars, it has dramatic impacts. We call this prison gerrymandering. Indeed, arguably, we are in a situation now that is pre-Civil War, right? Which is when a black body is worth three-fifths of a white body. Because in fact, in many prisons around the country right now, African Americans who are locked up there cannot vote, they don't have the franchise, but their physical bodies represent census population. 
census population matters because it determines your representation politically. It also, it, by the way, it determines your resources. There's another sort of hidden story here, which is that every body that goes into a prison as a census body takes $10,000 out of a city and resources for schools and roads and everything else, but that's a separate discussion. But what this fundamentally does is it changes power. So if you look at what this looks like in many places, I'll pick a few southern places for you because we like to think this is just a southern problem. And indeed, in Union County, Florida, 30%. 30% of the census population comes from people who can't vote and don't really live there. Same thing with Concho County, Texas. 33% of the census population are people who don't live there and cannot vote. So this is a very serious problem. Indeed, by the close of the 20th century, 21 rural counties in the United States owed over 21% of their population to prisoners in the 2000 census. So I hope I am drawing this picture of the way in which democracy is being distorted. But let's look right here in Wisconsin. Wisconsin is facing a really interesting situation, which is that state law, the Wisconsin statute 6.10, makes it clear that incarceration does not change a person's residence. And yet, despite that, that's not the way it plays out on the ground in many counties in this state. So one of the most important ones to look at is Wisconsin's 53rd Assembly District. Now, some of this is going to ring much more familiar to you than it does to me because you're, you're from this area. But let's look at this. The 53rd, the 53rd District here claims over 5,000 people, 5,583 people as residents of the district, even though the law says they should be counted where they live. And overall, there's this phenomenon of concentrating prisoners in prison communities in Wisconsin that, has that can change if it has not changed the way we actually do voting. Now, in this particular case, it gives nine, for every 90 residents of the 53rd district, it gives them the same political power as 100 residents. So it's, it's, again, it's this distortion of who really has the power. Now, in this district, notably, there's 2,784 African Americans. All of them but 590 are incarcerated. So this is, a, again, a complete distortion. Now, the State Assembly, this is, this is not the only part of the Wisconsin prison gerrymandering story. Indeed, the Prison Policy Institute, of which I'm a part, has done a lot of really important data mining of what this looks like in, in states across the country. And it is found that Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, I'm sorry. <laughs> It's found that Wisconsin, for example, counties such as Chippewa, Juneau, and Washara, is that it? Washara? Washara. Washara. See, this is a problem with not being local. Um, in these areas, if you live next to a prison, you get twice the influence over the future of your county as residents than the people who live somewhere else. So this is really profound. What's really striking, though, is if you look at the data that's come from these areas, as a result of the 2010 census, the most recent census. And I just want to walk very quickly through some of this. So the 2000 census just counted over 1,000 incarcerated people at the New Lisbon Correctional Institution as if they were residents of the city of New Lisbon, and they are not. Now, what this city does with this information, a lot of this is yet to be seen, right? So this is a state where, in fact, prison gerrymandering has not been so conclusive, but, it, but it, is, it is poised to be very conclusive. In other cities, it's deeply conclusive. It has completely changed resource allocation, and it's completely changed the drawing, the literal drawing of, of uh, power. Columbia County, the 2000 census counted incarcerating, uh, incarcerated people at the Columbia Correctional Institution and Columbia County Jail as if they resided at the prison rather than at their home addresses. Now, if the city of Portage decides to draw its common council wards based on this, based on the 2010 data, it would draw a ward where 72% of the resident population is actually incarcerated, okay? Fundamentally, this would give every 28 residents who live near the city, the city I'm sorry, who live near the facility, the same vo voice, political voice, as 100 represent residents living somewhere else. And again, the 775 prisoners in the Columbia Correctional Facility are currently used already to pad the population of a district in the north 
western part of the city of Portage. So there's, it depends on where you are in the city as to how this plays out, but this is kind of micro data mining that people just aren't doing, and so they're not quite realizing how this plays out. Waukesha? In Waukesha <laughs> County, the 2010 census has incarcerated people at that county facility, again, as if they were residents there, not in their home residence. Now again, if the city there draws its common council wards based on this, this census population data, it would draw a ward where 15% of the resident population is actually incarcerated and doesn't really live there. That would give every 85 residents the same political power as 100 residents somewhere else. And finally, Kenosha County, the 2010 census just counted the incarcerated people at Kenosha County Detention Center, Kenosha County Pretrial Facility, and the Kenosha Correctional Center as if they in fact resided there. If the city of Kenosha draws its common council water, it's based on this population data, it would draw a ward where 13% of the resident population actually lives somewhere else. So this is the good news story, because I kept using the word if, if, if. <laughs> but again, if we were in Virginia, if we were in Pennsylvania, if we were in New York until they just changed this, interestingly, we got rid of prison gerrymandering in New York. It was a huge battle, it was a very hard won. Uh, but this has been the reality story in many, many states. Now, last point, and I will, I will end. I want to suggest to you that there's another piece of this puzzle that matters a lot to the way in which the carceral state distorts democracy. That is to say that immigration matters a great deal to this story, too. And I didn't talk at all about immigration yesterday, um, but I want to bring it into the equation today. The rise of the carceral state has caused a major crackdown on immigrants as well. And that's why it matters to this story. So here's what should have happened. What should have happened is that as the country grew more Latino, the power of white citizens should have weakened politically. That's what should have happened. Now, some would say to an extent it has, right? So in the last presidential election, all the pundits were talking about how, you know, the, the, the Latino vote matters now in ways that it never did. But if it were proportionate to the growth that immigration has in fact brought to our country, it would have potentially meant a dramatic shift of political power. Indeed, because people would have gotten citizenship over time, right? So that would have shifted the, the voting power. But it's also important to realize not necessarily because people got citizenship. Indeed, you may not know this, but you didn't have to be a citizen always to vote in this country. This is sort of the, one, the flip side of the story that I told earlier. Indeed, non-citizens voted in myriad ways in local, state, and even federal capacities in American history. In fact, notably until a very specific time, 1920, when we cracked down on immigration the last time. So it wasn't always the case you had to be a citizen to vote, particularly for things like school board. I mean, things that really matter, right, in your community, things that where you lived, uh, your vote mattered. And indeed, even today, non-citizens do have some degree of voting power in several uh, uh, jur uh, jurisdictions in the United States. And according to research by people in the Immigrant Voting Rights Center, um, there have been many examples recently where states, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Vermont, California, Connecticut, Illinois, Maine, Maryland, North Carolina, Texas, Washington, D.C., and even Wisconsin, have tried to restore voting rights for non-citizens in various kinds of voting capacities. So with the country's demographics changing so dramatically over the last half of the 20th century and into the 21st, power should have shifted, and it should have shifted, it should have, the country should have democratized, just simply based on the demographics. Now that's not what happened. Again, a little bit, but not the way it should have. Now there's various reasons for this, and some of them I don't want to pretend like I'm going to give you the whole story. I mean, we have voter ID restriction, we got all kinds of stuff going on that, that are going to impact the, the franchise. But here's the other piece of the story. It's what we call crimigration. It's this linking between these questions of immigration and the carceral state. And this affects, and here's what people are not stopping to really think about. This affects undocumented people, but it also affects people who are here as citizens legally. And so this is a really important piece of the story. So first, let me talk about the undocumented piece of this. Since the late 1990s, the number of people held in immigration detention facilities has exploded, literally. 
On any given day, ICE literally detains over 33,000 people, which is more than triple the number of people it detained only in 1996. So this is, and as you know, I mean, this is again one of the sad marks on the Obama administration. Of course, he's deported more people than any previous uh, president. So this is, a, this is a dramatic story of detention and deportation. Uh, in the last five years alone, the annual number of immigrants detained and the cost of detaining them has doubled. In 2009, almost 400,000 immigrants were detained. This is an enormous cost, uh, and almost 3 million immigrants have passed through detention facilities in some form or fashion. Now, there's myriad parts of the story that I don't have time to fully get into, but needless to say, private prison companies are a huge part of the story. You may not know this, but the people who are now trying to build private prisons everywhere actually got into the game first through immigration detention centers. Uh, the contract between the INS and, the, and uh, the Corrections Corporation of America, which is one of the most notorious of this, is really kind of what gives birth to the private prison industry in 1983. And this is a huge booming business. In fact, arguably, uh, I'll show you a graphic in a moment, it, it's more significant than the private uh, prison industry for just regular uh, criminal justice work. So the percentage of beds, just to give you a sense, managed by private corporations in detention centers is significantly higher than in the regular uh, prison context. Currently, private prison companies manage more than 49% of all immigration detention beds. So this is significant, right? This means that you make your money out of this project of detaining people. And indeed, they are absolutely upfront about this. Uh, Correction Corporation of America said, absolutely, it would be terrible for our business if we change immigration laws. Absolutely, it would be terrible for our business if we got rid of drug laws. Um, they're, they're very upfront about this. And indeed, the uh, CEO of Geo Corporation made very clear after 9-11 that you know, federal business is great business for us. Uh, you know, Fighting terror is great business for us. Detention is good business for us. I want to just quickly look at this other slide only because you can go here yourself. It's really, it's a, one of these other things that's just fascinating. Oops, I don't like that. Um, because this is an interactive map, okay? This is the number of detention centers between 1981 and 2010. I'm going to hit this and just watch it roll. <coughs> So that's what we're talking about. This is a dramatic locking up. Where is that? This is uh, it's a PBS site. It's a frontline show on immigration. And I can give you the citation. So that's about the undocumented. Because what does it mean to be detained? It means that we are building the carceral state further and further and further, the same carceral state that's disfranchising everybody who's already here legally. So that's kind of the connection there. But it also matters to people who were already here legally and in the system. Because in fact, this entire process of, crim of, of criminalizing urban space that is primarily and directly affected African Americans, depending on where you live in the country, this is primarily and directly affected Latinos. So these are people who are citizens of this country who are being locked up in record numbers, right? Um, if you, here's, the, here's the, you know, the black rate of incarceration, the white rate of incarceration in between is the Latino rate of incarceration, again, ever growing. And these people are subject to the same kinds of felon disfranchisement. Uh, notice what is, the, what is the name of the case in 1974? Ramirez. Richardson versus Ramirez. So this takes us kind of full circle back to this issue of immigration and why this matters to our democracy. Indeed, the more immigrant spaces that are criminalized, both for, the, for those who are here legally and those who are not here without proper documentation, the more that the carceral state and the privatized carceral state in particular counts on immigration detention for its, prof, for its profits, the possibilities of opening up our democracy further, and as it should be with given demographic change, are definitely thwarted and it changes the way our nation is run. Very specifically, I want to make the case for you that it changes power in America. So if where you live is not where you vote, or if you can't vote because you are disfranchised, it's not value free. Real people with real politics are empowered when other people are disempowered. 
And that's the fundamental message here. It is not value three. It is not the case that if we disfranchise a bunch of people, it all it doesn't matter. It all stays the same. It doesn't stay the same. Again, in Wisconsin, we remain to see what happens after the 2010 sentence. But in norm in normal operations in many, many states in America, it has literally changed the power relationship between the governed and those, uh, the, the governing body and those who are governed. And it has also fundamentally cemented the system. And this is the last thing I want to leave you with. It gets back to the question I began with. Why don't we change this? Why don't the people most affected by this change it? Because when you criminalize people, and then you layer on there various laws and so forth that makes their ability to access the franchise impossible, you literally cement the same system that created the problem in the first place. And it becomes this chicken and egg situation. And so the people with the most power, ultimately, are the people who are running the system that takes away the power from everybody else. Now that's a bit of an overstatement, but it's not so much of an overstatement. Because what it harkens back to, again, I want to take you, just leave you with the end of the Civil War. It was not value free when Southern states decided to read Section 2 of the 14th Amendment as to say anyone who was locked up could no longer vote. It was not value free. It was very functional, it was very specific, and it dramatically changed power in the South, not just for a little while, not just for a little bit, but literally for 100 years. And we had a moment where we reaccessed that possibility for democracy with the Voting Rights Act of 1965, with the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s. But at that same moment, and for really interestingly complex reasons, we again criminalize spaces of color, we again disfranchise people in prison, and we again distort our democracy. Thank you. yesterday on that happy note. <laughs> <laughs> that that was possible if that's the way a state would interpret that clause and, and would just kind of proceed headlong to do that. But what happens after Richardson versus Ramirez is 48 out of 50 states decide it's a good idea to pass this kinds of legislation. So prior to this very important Supreme Court case, there's still a lot of areas where you've got disfranchisement, but in many of them it wasn't particularly enforced. Some of it was pretty localized. You might lose your vote for a little while. You might get it back. It was overwhelmingly concentrated in the South. And one of the things that happens after this case is it just becomes a national and really quite massive phenomenon. And again, I mean, I'm talking about the racialized component of it, but remember, 65 million Americans in general have a criminal record. This has repercussions for the entire democracy, even notwithstanding this very important question of race. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, uh, with the concept of non-value uh, free statements in politics, what do you think of the curious timing of the Supreme Court hearing about the Voting Rights Act, about how it's infringing <laughs> on uh, some states like Georgia versus their right to govern? Yeah. The curious timing of that. Well, I always say to my students that I don't believe in conspiracy theories and I won't let them write dissertations that are filled with them. But, but yeah, I mean, look, this is about, it, it, one doesn't have to be a conspiracy theorist to look very clearly at self-interest and what's at stake and politics. That's why I began with sort of broader history of voting, which is that voting has always been contentious. And access to the franchise has always been, con you know, even if you, if you take a class in the civil rights movement, this is something I always stress to my students, the entire civil rights movement was contentious. If you were in the South and you were a civil rights activist, black or white, it was a pretty dangerous time for you. But when does it get the most dangerous? When does it get really ugly, right? That's when people are going around the South trying to register people to vote, right? Because that's when power really can change. That's when it really matters. So I won't weigh in on the specifics of, uh, you know, pointing fingers. But I do think it's very important to always realize what is at stake in these battles over visiting any of these pieces of legislation over, over voting. Great point. Yes. Um, the 14th Amendment is, you know, you've really done a great job of uh, linking that to this 
question of disfranchisement. What I'm wondering about is the 13th, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> because uh, even before the whole question of the, you know, the definition of black citizenship was resolved, uh, the, the 13th Amendment, although it abolished slavery, it also gave a definition of who could be enslaved. Uh, you know, for well, I'm, to paraphrase the wording, uh, uh, slavery is abolished except in punishment of crime. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for after which, you know, as a result of uh, you know due process, blah 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But in, in some ways, it seems to me that's even more profound mm -hmm. because um, as a slave, the whole question of citizenship doesn't even arise. Yeah. So that's a wonderful point, and I actually talk a lot about the 13th Amendment, but more specifically, I use that when I talk about prison labor and the return to prison labor and sort of the slaves using, using the labor of prisoners uh, as slaves. Um, but you're absolutely right, because by determining someone's status, by, by making it possible to consider someone a non-citizen mm -hmm. because they're a slave is impo as important as the 13th And indeed, if I redo this talk, I'm going to remind us about the 13th Amendment. Because that's, that's very true. We can't have exceptions. This is the problem with having amendments that always have exceptions for things that do with criminality. Because what we see over the course of American history is that crimes, this very concept of crime, is historically constructed. What is a crime is not uh, a sure entity. Now, you might think, well, how can that be? I mean, if you're dead, you're dead. But there's all kinds of variations as to why you may be dead. Maybe you're dead because it's self-defense. Maybe you're dead. Who knows? What? So even homicide is contingent in historical moments, right? Whether or not you can kill an abusive husband in one century has a different version of criminal penalty than another century, right? Whether or not alcohol is illegal, whether or not drugs are so the fact that our own constitution makes exceptions for citizenship, for slavery, for labor, based on crimes committed, is inherently and fundamentally problematic. Because it makes an assumption, exception for something that is historically contingent. So thank you for that. Very, very important to bring that up. Yes? Yeah, I mean, what would you do the, with the argument a critic might make is as well, a lot of these people wouldn't vote anyway. because mm -hmm. they come, of course, from demographic groups, from the young, mm -hmm. from the poor, and so forth, where voting turnout is, is, is known to be quite low. That is exactly the criticism, um, mm -hmm. and um, it's a tough one. Uh, this is actually out of more out of my purview. And political scientists do a lot of work, and you know this from the work you do as a sociologist, on why people vote, who's voting, who votes more, when do they vote. But one thing that seems to be pretty suggestive in the literature is that the other side effect of mass incarceration and disfranchisement it is actually has a dampening effect on the vote, even of people who can vote. That is to say, your vote doesn't matter anymore. And some of the historical historians need to do some work on this because we need to, what we do know very kind of, you know, pro forma, what we need to dig into more, is that one of the most significant things about the Civil Rights Act is that when people are given the franchise, they vote. I mean, voting changes dramatically in the South. So the question is, when is the tipping vote point? When do people stop voting? Right? When do people no longer think it's in their interest to vote? And poverty is a piece of this puzzle. Feeling powerless is a piece of this puzzle. It's not the work I do, but I do just rest with the idea that we have a historical moment where we affirm the vote and we have direct upsurge in black voting, not just one, but two very specific ones, one after the Civil War and one after the Civil Rights Movement. And not potentially coincidentally, I would say not coincidentally, when we take away the franchise in ways fundamental, but also insidious, the ability to vote becomes, becomes almost irrelevant among those who still have the vote. So we can't, we, we can't tell anything from that, really. It, it would be very difficult to draw conclusions from the remaining voting population. The other thing is, as I made a point in my uh, talk yesterday, the other thing that mass incarceration does, and this is aside from voting, it literally destroys the fabric of communities. And one of the things about voting that we know just from political science literature is that voting means you feel like a citizen voting. But when you vote, you are exercising citizenship. You feel part of something. You feel like you can contribute to something. And the fundamental fallout from mass incarceration is an, it's an erosion of feeling of belonging and citizenship at the community level. So that's a really bad answer to your question. But, but, it, but I think we need to know a lot more about that. And you could also argue that 
if incarcerated folk or recently incarcerated folk could vote, there would be an incentive to mobilize them. It, well, absolutely, absolutely. And in, in fact, that's a great point because one of the things about felon disfranchisement is that many people who can vote think they can't. This was a huge issue in Obama's first, uh, in, the, in the first campaign. I, I mean, I remember at the time I lived in North Carolina and we did all kinds of voter registration work. And I would literally say time and again, yes, you can vote. Yes, you can vote. I mean, depending on who the person was and what the situation was. Most people who've served time in prison just assume that they can't vote because while they're incarcerated, they can't vote, right? And so just taking away someone's right to vote for five years, for three years, for 24 months, for 30 years, that changes the way you think about yourself as a voting citizen. So think, I like that answer. We're going to go back to that one. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, so in terms of the effect of um, on the large-scale politics in the country, what you've talked about is mostly you know, a structural bias uh, away from Democrats and towards Republicans. I think it's important, but it, it wouldn't actually make my top two list of problems with democracy right now. Mm -hmm. Seems to me the first is that it doesn't seem like what ordinary people do or think matters. So, for example, the vast majority of the country was in favor of bailing out homeowners instead of financial services mm -hmm. companies, but it didn't make any effect to political deliberations. And secondly, that when you do vote, your choice is between the party of neoliberalism, the carceral state, the war on terror, punitive treatment of immigrants, mm -hmm. entrenchment of corporate privilege, and the crazy part. Um, <laughs> can you say something about what you think is the relationship of the carceral state and those things? Yes. So, fundamentally connected to what you're saying, that's one of the reasons why I always begin every talk talking about the beginning of the war on crime to make clear that it's a bipartisan effort. And the, the reality is that Democrats and Republicans alike are responsible for and complicit in the buildup of the carceral state to the extent that it now exists. Okay, so that's number one. And my point about Democrats losing power to Republicans, I, I hope it is not construed to suggest that had those de Democrats won, that we would be in some fundamentally different place than we are right now. But it does still matter, and it matters in part because things like private prison companies members of organizations, legislative organizations like ALEC, people who are most conservative on immigration law, people who are most punitive in most laws, are disproportionately Republican. So that does matter. I mean, I don't know if you've seen the news today where McCain is getting uh, hell from his, his town hall because he might be talking to the president about immigration reform. So, so there are some differences between parties, but to your broader point, which is why is the polity in general so skewed to an elite and so disconnected from uh, the masses? I, 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 don't, I don't think that I disagree with that, and I, and I, but, I, but I would say don't underestimate what it means to have this many people locked out of the political process. That is to say, if we had, in fact, followed the demographic trend of what it meant to really change the demographics of this country electorally, you know, is that third party option as crazy as it might look today? I mean, we don't even know because every moment in time when we had a possibility of opening up the franchise, we had all these things on it to close it. So I don't disagree at all, but I do think we need to start looking at this as one of those reasons why why, for example, we don't talk about crime and punishment in any party, anywhere, at any time when decisions are being made. Because the people most affected by it have no voice in the polity. So, you know, agreed, and let's con also consider the uh, disfranchisement. I think it's important. Yeah. Just wanted to add a couple local facts for Wisconsin mm -hmm. that approximately 6% of our population is African American and 51% of those currently in prison are African American. And in, in 2000 in Wisconsin when the Truth and Sentencing Act was passed, uh, the, tip, the average sentence increased by 33% and the average time on extended supervision during which you still cannot vote was increased by 135%. Right. So as recently as 2000, the problem has been much exacerbated. That's right. And again, back to voting. If you have a state with such a low percentage of African Americans on, in, the, in, the, in the in public space, 
put such a high percentage behind bars, that changes voting. I don't have the data. I haven't crunched the numbers. But it changes the way people think about other people. It changes the way they vote about crime. It changes what they think is happening in their universe. And so in that way, there is this whole psychological dimension to the carceral state, which has been devastating. The face of criminality is a face of color. And particularly in states where the numbers, you would not be perhaps surprised to know that the states with the worst differential between white and black incarceration are all in the North. I mean, that is to say, if you are African American, you have a much greater chance of being singled out by the criminal justice system if you live in the North. Now this sort of strikes us as, well, what are you talking about? Texas has all the prisons. Louisiana's constantly making the news for how many black folks are locked up. But proportionally, you are far more likely to be pulled over by a police officer in a Northern state than in the Southern, which is really profound how we think about criminality. About six years ago, seven years ago, Wisconsin was voted the worst state in the country to be an African-American name, yeah. based primarily on racial uh, the disparity and right. incarceration. Right? And the thing is, as white folks, white folks know this. I mean, this is, this is sort of the, the thing about whiteness and white privilege that no one talks about. The fact is, is that when white people are in all white communities and a police officer drives by, speeding what's going on here right but if you're a white person that lives in a mostly african-american city police cars drive back drive past you and there's this sort of sense of, of um, I don't know immunity to it all I mean it's, it's really extraordinary how this changes the way people act walk talk think and that's again this is in a realm of psychology and perception and so forth that you know I don't do that kind of work but it, you know it's been people anecdotally people talk about this a lot so very interesting. Yes. Do you consider the Wisconsin legislature voting uh, for voter ID bills, and there are other states doing that the same? Do you would you consider that as part of supporting your theory about disenfranchisement? Absolutely, absolutely. Because and this is an interesting targeting, not just <coughs> people of color, but also people on the margins. I mean, it's always about the sort of the mar the the least. Enfranchised people are the most marginal people, right? The people who are least likely to have the driver's license, the people least likely to have the cards, the documentation, the, the, the stuff they need to prove their citizenship. So again, I'm much more familiar with what just happened in, in Pennsylvania, but I just happened to be going to get my driver's license right when this was in the thick of all this, and I literally sat there and watched people, one right after the other, be turned away because they didn't have the right documentation. And the ironic thing was most of them were little old ladies. So people who needed this voter ID card, but they, you know, <laughs> my, my birth certificate, are you kidding me? You know, I mean, where, where was last time I saw that? So it is a way of shifting power. And again, this is where party probably does matter because in Pennsylvania, that, that lined up on party lines pretty clearly, who was for it and who was against it. Not always, but, um, but enough to notice. Any last questions or yes? Could you talk about New York? About what happened in New York? Yeah, in how, terms they, of, the, how they actually went through the direction. Right. So if you're really interested in this, there's a there's a really important uh, group. I, I'm actually just on their board. I don't do the scut work. I use all their data and I get to sing their praises. But it's called the Prison Policy Initiative. And you can look at you can look them up online. They also have this great website, and they tell you the whole story of what prison gerrymandering looks like in states across the nation. And they were central to the New York case. Um, sort of a it's a very small shop of people um, who are doing the hard data research to show what it's really doing. How is it really skewing um, districts? How is it really skewing representation? And so there was a lot of testifying, a lot of going before the state assembly, a lot of evidence production to show that this was changing democracy in the state. Now notably, in New York, the prisons are overwhelmingly, in upstate New York, right, the prisoners are overwhelmingly coming, not solely from New York City, but New York City, Buffalo, Rochester, very specific areas. And many of the legislators in the upstate region were well aware. I mean, they, Senator Volcker was absolutely clear. He said, you know, well, uh, I'm, I'm really glad the prisoners in my district don't vote because if they did, they wouldn't vote for me. I mean, that's one of his sort of famous quotes. So it, they fought it, um, but ultimately they were unsuccessful. I mean, it was just, it just, 
once you kind of look at the stuff, it's very difficult to make the case for it. So, I mean, and that's, that's, I mean, that's sort of the short version of what happened. That's why you should really pay attention to Wisconsin. It's very interesting to see what's going to happen. You do have state law that would make it very easy to fight if it happened. But it's also very significant that the census counted all those people where they were locked up and not where they lived. And that could have an effect as it has had in many different parts of the country. Thank you so much. Thank you.